Hey everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to the second episode of Australia's Biggest Book Club and our final webinar for 2023. Thanks so much for coming along. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respect to Elders past and present and welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Um, sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, just a reminder for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, but Australia's Biggest Book Club is a new webinar series that we've just launched and every month we'll be featuring a book and author uh, for the book club on our webinar series and you can sign up for that if you haven't already at australiainstitute.org.au and you can find all our other upcoming webinars and events on the website as well. In January, we'll be talking to David Ma about his new book, Killing for Country. Uh, uh, just a few tips for Zoom before we begin. So if you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to type in questions for our panel and you should be able to upvote and comment on other people's questions as well. A reminder to please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. And lastly, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and it'll go up on our website and YouTube channel later today. So I'm really excited about today's event and this book. Uh, you can see it right here before you, 2023, A Year of Consequence. Uh, it's a new book out by The Conversation. Uh, and it was a year of consequence here and across the world, dominated by the voice to parliament here domestically, as well as a cost of living crisis. Uh, and globally, obviously, we've seen enormous conflict and disruption and upheaval. The conversations, academics and journalists covered all these issues and more, providing evidence-based research to help guide policymakers and decision makers and everyday Australians to make informed decisions at pivotal times in our lives. And this book is really a record of uh, all their work at the front lines and in this year of consequential decisions. I'm delighted to introduce our panel today. Um, I'm joined by Executive Director Richard Dennis. Uh, Justin Bergman and Emma Shortus are joining us. Justin is the international affairs editor at The Conversation and edited this book. And Emma, Dr. Emma Shortus is uh, a senior researcher in the Australia Institute's International and Security Affairs Program and a contributor to this book. And Dr. Jim Stanford is economist and director at the Centre for Future Work. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, Justin, I did want to start with you. Obviously, the conversation has so many contributors and across a year publishes um, so many amazing contributions. How did you go about this task of selecting the, the essays that were to be included in this book? Uh, yep. Well, first of all, I'll say hello to everybody uh, and thanks for having us here. It's great to be able to talk about the book. So yeah, it's been a real uh, labor of love, this book, um, mainly because like you said, we have so many contributors that write so many essays throughout the year. And so trying to pick the best 50 or 60 to include in, a, in an anthology is, is quite difficult. So mainly there were a couple of things we, we try to keep in mind um, every year when we do this, and that's um, that this is uh, gonna serve as a year in review as a way. So people would pick this up in December and January and be able to reflect on the big stories from the past year, um, what really mattered, what people were thinking about, what people were talking about. Uh, and as part of that, this was a snapshot of the intellectual scene and how our authors, how our big thinkers and, and experts in these subjects were trying to make sense of these issues for uh, really an everyday audience because our, our mantra is uh, expert-driven academic written, but it's for a mainstream audience. That's where we, the journalists, come into play and try to make the stories approachable and accessible. So the, the goal was to do that, was to have this snapshot of the year and review, but also an intellectual kind of uh, thing that to, to showcase our deep thinking on different issues, um, especially the ones you just mentioned and, and others. Um, but also I think that with this one in particular, I wanted to bring in more writerly pieces toward the end of the book. Um, we have a new section here called Books and Ideas, which uh, launched last year, I think, it's been about a year, uh, and they produce much longer form essays, uh, which are related to mostly books, but also big ideas. Um, and so they're more personal, reflective pieces. And the final two chapters of the book really show this. We have some very long essays that are more creative writing. Um, 
to kind of show the breadth of writing we're trying to now produce here. Um, thanks. Yeah, it must have been a, a very big task to get through all of that. Um, uh, Richard, I wanted to come to you next. Uh, the essay that you have contributed in here was from much earlier in the year, uh, looking at the huge number of oil, gas and coal projects in the pipeline for Australia. Um, obviously, we're in the final days of COP um, and the idea of a fossil fuel phase out is the one that's being um, debated at the moment, but where does Australia sit in terms of our contribution in fossil fuels? Well, Australia is uh, the third biggest fossil fuel exporter in the world. Uh, Saudi Arabia one, Russia two, Australia three. Uh, but you know we're, we're we're an ambitious country. We're, we're we're gunning for those Russians, and we think if we can uh, build enough new coal and gas projects, we might get to number two if we try really really hard and if we subsidise the industry enough. So, yeah, there's a real contradiction that lays at the heart of Australia. On the one hand, we've got a new government saying uh, the grown-ups are back in charge. We want to tackle climate change. We want to make friends with the Pacific. You know, we want to be constructive players on the on the world stage. Oh, and by the way, there's, and, well, there's 112 new gas and coal projects now. The good news is the pipeline's shrinking, uh, but it's only because we've approved four already. Uh, so, yeah, Australia is walking both sides of the street and and the government's deeply frustrated about this. They're like, but look, we we want more solar panels and windmills than the coalition. We're better than them on climate. And that's true. But they share exactly the same policy uh, when it comes to uh, fossil fuel projects. Indeed, Labor's first budget had one and a half billion dollars in subsidies for a new gas project up in the north. So, yeah, unfortunately, what we're seeing at COP at the moment is the petro states saying, no, no, we need to keep producing a lot of fossil fuels. And the Pacific Island states saying, you really got to stop. And Chris Bowen's trying to say, hey, we're both. We're both. We, we're a petro state with enormous fossil fuel expansion, but we're with the Pacific states on this phasing out thing. So, you know, Australia, as always, plays a very, very good diplomatic role. We're very good at diplomacy. So we want to phase out unabated coal and unabated gas. Doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> it means that we're going to press ahead, subsidised expansion of coal and gas, and maybe one day magical technologies will suck the carbon out of the atmosphere and as long as we, you know, cross our fingers and hope, uh, that'll be all right. So the science says, the IEA says, the uh, the UNFCCC says, the UN Secretary General says, no new fossil fuels. Australia is saying, oh yeah, I hear that. No, but it's okay if we have faith in magical future technologies. Um, and just before we move on, I just feel like um, people don't necessarily understand like Australia doesn't think of itself in the same way as we think of the United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia being big kind of fossil fuel producers but yeah, yeah can you just remind us kind of yeah. how big we are we're huge like you know we've got a continent the size of North America and a population the size of Singapore and and no one quite understands in Australia or around the world what happens on our land mass so Australia's got a bigger share of the world traded coal market, the coal that gets put on boats, Australia's got a bigger share of that than Saudi Arabia has of the oil market. And iron ore, Australia's got a bigger share of the iron ore market than OPEC, than OPEC has in, in, in oil and gas. So Australia is an enormous exporter of this stuff, but it's all foreign owned. It doesn't employ many people. It doesn't pay much tax, but we're, yeah, we're walking both sides of the street and yeah, we're, we're a far bigger exporter of fossil fuels than the United Arab Emirates. We're a bigger exporter of gas than Qatar, Qatar's second biggest. Qatar collects 20 times more tax on gas than we do. Yeah, We export more gas than them. They collect 20, to, 20 times more gas tax than us. Doing something wrong there. Uh, Emma, I wanted to come to you next. We've seen this week um, some polling out in the United States that Trump is polling better than Biden. Um, and your essay looked at um, basically the issue of wokeness uh, and how that's kind of taken over the conservative um, uh, political parties in America or the, the political party in America and how that's kind of dominated their conversations and campaigns. Um, is that still an issue? And uh, and why is it so overtaken um, Republicans? 
Yeah, thanks, Sam. So, so our essay was on um, the, the so-called war on woke in the United States, um, which was actually a piece uh, that I wrote with a colleague, Dr. Liam Byrne, that um, Justin commissioned us uh, to write. And it was in the context of a kind of explosion of, of conversations about wokeness, um, particularly because Ron DeSantis in Florida was engaged in this kind of weird culture war on um, Disney and Mickey Mouse, <laughs> um, which was bizarre enough in and of itself. Um, but our the aim of our essay was to really, I guess, contextualise this culture war in, um, I guess, the broader sweep of American history and note that it's not a new phenomenon, this idea of the war on woke, but it's in fact kind of deeply his connected to um, the history of white supremacy in the United States and particularly, I guess, far-right conservatism. And so our essay gave us the opportunity to really contextualise that and to demonstrate how, you know, when Donald Trump is talking about, um, you know, people being woke or Ron DeSantis is talking about the woke mind virus, what they're doing is, is tapping into that history, um, to that history of culture wars and speaking in really coded language to a base that's kind of, I guess, ticking all the, the check boxes of, of white supremacy and racism in the United States. So this certainly is not an issue that, that is going away. You know, these, these culture wars have kind of captured the Republican Party and really helped, I think, it to mobilise. You know, Donald Trump hasn't created this phenomenon. He's kind of riding this wave, I think, um, of the of the war on woke. And it's worked really well for him so far. So, I, you know, I think he will continue it. And you can see... Um, his competitors for, for the nomination, as, as unserious as some of them are, you know, trying to almost out-Trump Trump when it comes to their kind of work, war on woke language. Um, so I, I expect we'll see a lot more of it in the next year. And I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit more about how that is manifesting. Like what kinds of things are we seeing uh, in this war on wokeness? How is it like visible to people? Sure. I, I actually think one of the um, the biggest and kind of most unexpected ways that it's showing itself is in this really dramatic shift that we've seen around Russia in the United States, which I think is is kind of quite confusing when we're used to the recent history of the United States and Russia being kind of existential en enemies. But what we've seen in, in this kind of cultural shift around, around wokeness is that the far right of the United States now feels an ideological alignment with Vladimir Putin's Russia. So Steve Bannon, who was one of Donald Trump's advisors and is still really prominent in the move in the movement, has said, I think the quote is something like, Putin ain't woke. And so you can see that manifesting in Congress where Republicans, conservative Republicans, are refusing to authorize funding for Ukraine to support the, the defense of Ukraine. And so that culture war is having really material consequences for, for the rest of the world. Thank you. Um, Jim, I want to come to you next. We've seen uh, a kind of a raft of IR-related laws in the parliament as it draws to a, as it drew to a close this year. Um, but you wrote earlier this year on a different issue um, that affects unions in particular, which is the issue of free riding. Can you just explain what that is for us? Uh, sure, Ebony. Um, the free rider problem is a, a well-known issue in economics, and it applies in all kinds of areas around public services and public goods, but also uh, corporate behavior and corporate governance. And in this case, uh, I'm referring to the free rider problem in collective bargaining. The general problem of uh, free riding is what happens when you cannot control access to a certain good or service that's produced um, by limiting it just to people who pay for it. It's more publicly uh, available. In the extreme, uh, a pure uh, public good like national security or a clean environment are things that everybody can benefit from. And uh, given that you can't charge people for it, um, the tendency will be for an economy to underproduce that good or service or devalue it uh, below where it, where it should be valued. Um, and this is why uh, over the years, uh, over the centuries, really, governments uh, have developed different regulations and systems to pay for the stuff that suffers from the free rider problem. Everything from regulations around uh, corporate governance or things like a, a, a strata, a residential strata, for example, uh, which uh, uh, if you buy a unit in a strata, you're required to pay a monthly fee towards the upkeep of the common facilities, uh, right 
up to paying taxes for the public services. It's, none of those things are subject to your individual choice, whether you want to pay or not. You're required to pay, and for good reason, because if we don't collect from people, uh, those goods and services will not be produced and we'll all be worse off. Uh, one place where the free rider problem has been allowed to run amok, however, is in uh, the world of unions and collective bargaining. And uh, I think because of the ideological attack on trade unions, there's been a reification of this ideology of individual choice saying it's up to each individual worker to decide whether they want to pay anything towards the uh, enterprise agreement that uh, has determined what their wages and benefits and conditions will be. And uh, it's not an accident that, uh, you know, corporate uh, corporate governance uh, has found ways to solve the free rider problem, residential stratas, governments, but uh, unions on the other hand uh, are left to basically go around and collect uh, dues from individual members who at least see the big picture enough to know that uh, if they don't support the union, then they won't have an enterprise uh, agreement. And in Australia's case, uh, the free rider uh, situation is given full legal protection. Uh, Australia is very similar to the so-called right to work states in the US South, places like Alabama and Mississippi, which also uh, prohibit any type of union security or closed shop or agency arrangement or bargaining fees. Uh, in order to make sure that unions have the resources that are required to negotiate enterprise agreements and then implement them and uh, enforce them. So um, the the area of industrial relations is one that's seen some significant progress under the current government uh, in Australia, no doubt about it. The uh, uh, Better Jobs uh, bill last year and the Closing Loopholes uh, bill this year had some very significant improvements to support uh, workers' rights and uh, in some ways support collective bargaining. But this issue of the free rider problem is one that has not been touched yet. So uh, I wrote this piece in the conversation uh, earlier in, in the year to try and sort of raise this issue as another thing that's got to be on the agenda. You know, maybe not, uh, maybe not this year, but somewhere down the road, because uh, otherwise there's no uh, there's no encouragement for individuals to to join their union, and that means the collective bargaining system in Australia will continue to be starved of resources even as these reforms are um in theory anyway creating more space and opportunity for collective bargaining yeah and jim can you just um bring us up to date with where collective bargaining is at in australia because i know that's something the center for future work has has worked on a lot um you've kind of talked about this specific part of it but what does collective mm -hmm. bargaining look like currently yeah, we've seen a, a very dangerous decline in collective bargaining in Australia over the last decade, really uh, dating back to 2013 when the coalition got back into power and implemented a, a number of rules again to restrict uh, union activity and just generally discourage uh, unions and collective bargaining. Uh, so the uh, proportion of Australian workers who are covered by a current enterprise agreement now, uh, that is one that's still in effect and giving you wage increases has fallen to about 15 percent uh, of uh, the overall workforce, uh, down from between 25 and 30 percent uh, a decade ago, uh, even lower in the private sector. It'd be more like about 10 percent of workers in the private sector are covered by a current enterprise agreement. What that means is the vast majority of workers have uh, either uh, are covered by an award, one of the modern awards that just sets bare minimum standards, or uh, they have an individual contract where in theory they just have to go and try and negotiate with their employer one-on-one -on -one, uh, in order to get a wage increase and uh, it just doesn't happen that way that's reality unless you are totally you know unique and irreplaceable you cannot generally negotiate uh, wage increases just for yourself so the um, the big decline in um, collective bargaining in australia which i think is in part a result of this free rider problem and how it's fully protected uh, in australia uh, that uh, that problem is uh, getting worse. And because collective bargaining is, is shrinking, we're getting uh, more problems of wage stagnation, uh, inequality, and job insecurity in Australia. Um, Justin, I want to come back to you. Obviously, there's um, a whole bunch of other articles and, and essays in here. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the other things that people can read about if they pick up a copy of this book? Uh, yeah, for sure. I think, you know, one of the main issues of the year, the year of consequence, as we call the book, was, of course, the Voice to Parliament referendum. And um, very early on in the year, when, you know, this was back in February, even, I think was when we began thinking about it and how are we going to cover this as, an, as a news organization? What are we going to be doing to help uh, contribute to the public debate and public knowledge around this issue? And so, 
uh, very early on, we put out a, um, a call out to readers um, on social media saying, if you have questions about this, please send them to us. We're, we're going to have experts answer them for you. And we received about 9,000 responses from readers of questions that they had about this proposal. Um, this was, you know, like I said, in the early part of the year where the discussion was really just beginning. So there were a lot of uncertainties. There were a lot of things people didn't understand. Um, and so we published about two dozen of these articles throughout the year, uh, mainly explainers, you know, things we started with, what is the voice to parliament? How did it come about? Come about? Um, but then we expanded that beyond and, and went into um, uh, lots of other things, truth telling, uh, why uh, First Nations representation in parliament matters and why the voice to parliament is different. And, um, you know, we have a huge team here who was contributing to this, including our wonderful First Nations policy editor who was spearheading most of these these articles. Uh, so, you know, at the end of the year, when we were reflecting on this and how we were going to cover this in the book, uh, we, we, we knew that the, the referendum was likely to fail before the publication. We had um, the book opened, the, the, our wonderful publisher decided to wait to, to send the book to print until after the referendum result was known so we could include a couple late essays, which also allowed us to cover the Gaza War, which um, just happened to happen in, in early October as well. So um, we, we commissioned two pieces specifically for the book that were uh, from First Nations authors reflecting on what the defeat of the referendum meant to them. And uh, all of the work we, we put in throughout the year was leading up to this, to this, um, this event and this coverage that we gave to it. Uh, but after the defeat, we felt like the only essays that really mattered at that point were, what does this mean to First Nations communities? What does this mean to the future of the country? Where do we go from here? So that is the first chapter of the book. It's, de it's devoted to the voice to parliament. We included a couple essays that are more historical in nature to, to kind of go along with those. Uh, so, you know, looking way back in history um, as to how previous governments have failed to listen to First Nations people. Uh, so th that was the main focus. We thought um, initially this might be a big part of the book and it ended up being the, the focal point, but um, obviously there were many, many other issues that we wanted to include. Uh, from an international standpoint, we have an essay from uh, our, our great uh, expert on Russia who's contributed many articles over the past two years, Matthew Sussex at ANU, and he's written a piece about the legacy of Vladimir Putin after the war is long gone, you know, what, will, what Russia will he leave behind for future generations? Uh, so that was another piece that I commissioned specifically for the book because I wanted something that was a little bit of a bigger picture uh, thought piece that would still be valid no matter what's happening at the end of the year with the war. And we did, we, like I said, we were able to include a piece on, on Israel Hamas um, very early on in the conflict. And I commissioned a piece from a peace and studies, uh, peace and conflict studies uh, academic at the University of Sydney named Ayo Myraz, who is uh, Israeli himself um, and sought to put this conflict in perspective and contextualize it for um, audiences with the with the, the aim of not taking any sides on any position or, or, or you know who's right and who's wrong, he very very carefully negotiates this um, in the piece, uh, looking at how we ended up at this point. You know what what led up to this conflict erupting on October seventh, uh, and then he goes into you know how trust and empathy has broken down over generations between the two sides, how listening has stopped long ago, why why this has been problematic and how this was pretty much unavoidable, this, this kind of ongoing war and, um, and how, how badly it's gotten in the, in the past few weeks. Uh, and lastly, he, he attempts at this very early stage in the conflict to say what might work in terms of a solution. So it's well worth a read. Uh, even though this, this article is still six, is about six weeks old now, I think it still puts into context a lot of what we're wondering about this conflict and where it came from. Yeah, um, I can see we've got uh, more than 360 people on the line with us. And just a reminder that you can type in questions for um, uh, our panellists here. Um, we had uh, close to 800 people register today. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming along. You can also um, upvote other people's questions if you think it's a good one. That'll help me find um, the ones that people want answered Um the most. So I'll come to questions from the audience um, soon. But Richard, um, it's been a big year in politics, I guess. Um, 
I just wondered if I could get some reflections from you. Um, obviously, the the voice, is, as Justin mentioned, has been a big thing, but cost of living has been another huge um, thing that we've seen this year uh, and inflation, obviously, as another big problem for the government to manage. Just before we go to questions from um, the audience, can I just get, get you to quickly kind of address where the government has landed on that and where Australians find themselves? Yeah, look, I think uh, the, the the Albanese government has defined itself so almost completely by the being the kind of government that says what they do and do what they say and keep their promises. And, and these are all virtues, to be clear, but they're the opposite of reacting to circumstances. They're the opposite of dealing with new challenges as they come along. So I think halfway through this government, uh, this term, this government's beginning to to struggle in, in, in multiple ways because it's so committed to kind of getting all of its homework in and deliver all the promises it made in 2021 that a lot of people are experiencing problems in, in 2023 that just weren't on the board at the time. So uh, the the you know the the prime minister unfortunately invested a lot of personal capital in the referendum and has lost a lot of capital. That's not devastating for the prime minister or the government, but it really did distract the government from dealing directly with the cost of living crisis as it began to emerge. So now I think the government is kind of uh, a bit behind the game on cost of living. The other problem it's got is, of course, it, it promised back before the election to implement Scott Morrison's stage three tax cuts. So we've got these $300 billion worth of tax cuts that are going to kick in next year. But these tax cuts will deliver literally nothing for people earning below $45,000, almost nothing for people between 45 and 80, and $9,000 a year to high income earners, $9,000 a year tax cut. July 1 next year for people earning over 200,000. So here's the government making a virtue out of keeping Scott Morrison's old promise when actually what they need to do is react to a genuine cost of living crisis that's driven in large part by rising profits. And those rising profits are pushing inflation up, not wages. At least, you know, that that debate's kind of uh, moved on, but profits are driving prices up. Uh, and so are costs around the world. And the consequence of this is you've got an Albanese government saying, yeah, but look at the promises we're keeping that we made before the election. So it's not too late for this government to pivot, but I think that the the, the flat-footedness when it comes to the cost of living crisis, their reluctance to announce you know, big new policies to address falling real wages and rising cost of living uh, yeah, it's, it's starting to bite as, as, as the government hits midterm. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to questions from the audience now. Um, so just a reminder, um, we've had Emma talking about wokeness and the war on work in the United States. Uh, if you've got questions for Jim about free riding and, uh, collective bargaining and Richard on Australia's fossil fuel exports and other things. And Justin can speak to some of the other, um, essays and contributions in the book. Um, the first question I've got is from Ruth Gunther. Um, Emma, this one's for you. Uh, she's asking, do we not have the same issue about wokeness in Australia? She's thinking of the conservative outrage at Pat Cummins, um, uh, in particular for his woke stance on removing Alinta as a sponsor. How does wokeness play out in the Australian political debate? Yeah, thanks, Ruth. I think that's a, a really good point. And, and it's a really, um, I guess, strong example of the, I guess, the networks and links between Australian political culture and American political culture, where we often see the same kinds of culture wars that are happening in the United States around uh, wokeness, where there's this kind of really strange idea about cancel culture that's often um, espoused, I suppose, by by the right wing of politics, where they're kind of worried about, you know, people being cancelled. And, and what we find, in fact, is that it's often right wing conservative um, commentators who are attempting to cancel people whose views they don't agree with. Um, and especially, you know, people who have progressive so-called uh, I guess, woke views, um, and, and we see that playing out in parallel in the United States and in Australia. And I think in, in the context of Australian democracy, you know, that's really quite concerning. And I think we saw the way that that played out. Um, you know, we were talking about the voice re referendum before, the way that those kind of culture wars, I suppose, um, play out in larger political conversations and 
quite deliberately distort them with, um, you know, talk, I suppose, of, of wokeness um, and just how easily that slips into conspiracy thinking and, and the spreading of misinformation. And look, the United States is, it has always been an imperfect and, and fragile democracy, but that kind of deliberate misinformation and the peddling of misinformation, particularly by the by the far right, and the normalization of extreme ideas, and particularly um, the normalization of white supremacist ideas, is having a devastating effect on American democracy and American political culture. And we can see in real time efforts by conservatives in Australia to import that and import those tactics directly into um, Australia. Which is not to say we don't have our own history of that, of course, um, but there, there, there are those deep connections. I, I suppose to um, try and be a little bit more hopeful, you know, it, it's important to remember that Australia has very different political, a very different political culture and political institutions to the United States. And we do have agency in, in addressing issues like disinformation um, and the way that it, it affects our politics. I think there's a real sense of almost, um, and, and Justin could probably speak to this too, but there's a sense of kind of resignation in the United States in particular that there's, you know, there's nothing to be done about the state of the dire state of um, American politics. And I think that's just, it's not true. I mean, it's not true in the United States, but it's especially not true in Australia as well. Yeah. And um, for anyone interested, the Australia Institute has actually done some polling on wokeness and what people think about it in Australia. And uh Unsurprisingly, lots of people don't know what anyone means by woke, probably because it's been applied to everyone from mm -hmm. Disney to the Pope to Australia's a cricket captain. Um, <laughs> but also a bunch of people kind of see it as a positive thing about being respectful and um, paying attention to social injustice. So potentially not the rhetorical political weapon in Australia that it is in the United States. Um, Richard, the next question that I've got is from Andrew Karikis, who just says, is it just corporate greed that drives fossil fuel expansion? Um, uh, 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 fossil fuel expansion, if you don't burn them, when there is, if you don't burn them, a role for hydrocarbons in industry into the future? Uh, look, Corporate greed, uh, yeah, of course. People make enormous amounts of money taking gas out of the ground for free and selling it at a very high world price. And do the people making that money have to deal directly with the consequences of climate change? No. Do they have to deal directly with the environmental consequences on the ground? No. Uh, you know, fossil fuel industry is not the only industry driven by greed. There's plenty of that around in, in a capitalist economy. Uh, but the fossil fuel industry is uniquely profitable because the product is very high price and the cost of extraction in a country like Australia is very, very low. Now, smart countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar collect an enormous amount of tax. Uh, the reason the fossil fuel industry loves Australia so much is we're willing to actually subsidise uh, their exploration and their construction and, and, and we leave the profits largely untaxed. So you bet. Uh, the, the people that own the rights to extract our fossil fuels and sell them at the price they can get are desperate to keep going. They're desperate for us to keep subsidising them. Um, is there a role for burning fossil fuels in a modern economy? Yeah, of course there is. And we have to be really careful at like this, this bizarre rhetoric. It'll have a role to play for decades to come. Meaningless thing to say. That role is to decline. Right? The role is to decline. And, and the last people burning fossil fuels should be using the fossil fuels for the tasks that only fossil fuels can really do, like, I don't know, putting a billionaire into space or, or something. Uh, but there's no doubt it's easy to abate emissions. It's easy to avoid emissions in our electricity sector, for example, you know, renewable energies with storage, that's really easy. Uh, it's really hard at the moment to make large amounts of concrete without creating a lot of emissions. But, you know, there's there's ways to, so so yes, we're still going to be consuming fossil fuels in, in jet planes, for example. There's, there's no battery that's going to get someone from Australia to the Pacific, let alone to Europe for quite some time. But boy, there's enormous capacity to, you know, shift our car fleet away from the enormous utes that dominate our roads now to insulate our houses, to switch to renew, like all that stuff's easy. Uh, and we'll still be burning some fossil fuels for decades to come, 
but we don't have to be exploring for new ones to to cope with. Yeah. Uh, the next question I've got is for you, Jim, and it's about um, the issue of kind of anti-union um, sentiment and, and I guess, legislation. Um, I'm not sure if it refers to what we've seen in the past or um, something specific at the moment, the, the questioner John has talked about in the Pilbara region. Um, but can you just tell us a little bit, I mean, we've seen a lot of IR laws um, recently come through the parliament. Uh, as you mentioned um uh, a lot of issues came out of the the previous coalition government's um, uh, attempts to kind of crack down on unionism. Uh, what are some of those IR provisions that we've seen change this year as a priority for the Albanese government? Uh, well, there's been a, a few kind of um, uh, swaths of uh, reform legislation from the government. The first one came in late last year, actually, at the end of uh, 2022, an uh, omnibus package of uh, different reforms in collective bargaining, changes mostly to the Fair Work Act. Now, the Fair Work Act, if you remember, was uh, brought in by the previous uh, Labour government uh, under um, Rudd and then Gillard uh, as a response to the work choices laws of the former Howard uh, coalition government, which were very, very anti-union. They were aimed at uh, basically trying to eliminate unions uh, as a, uh, an effective force in labor relations. So uh, Howard was voted out in part because of those laws. Um, the Rudd government brought in the Fair Work Act, which unfortunately in retrospect kept most of the uh, previous regime in place. Uh, then the coalition came back in in 2013 and kind of had that ratchet effect again. Every time the coalition comes in, they they push the the uh, pressure down a bit further on unions. Uh, so now with a, a labor government, uh, we have seen, I think, a genuine effort to try and push the ne needle back in the other direction. Uh, the reforms last year opened up more opportunities for collective bargaining, including at the multi-employer level. That was one of the very important and controversial aspects of it. Uh, so that there's two different ways uh, in which uh, unions could uh, initiate collective bargaining across multiple workplaces and different employers uh, if they get uh, approval for it uh, from the Fair Work Commission. It remains to be seen uh, how those how effective those will be, but I think there's some promise, particularly in uh, low wage care sectors of the economy. Uh, one of the first uh, cases uh, coming forward will be in um, uh, in the care economy. Um, now, uh, the second set of, of major changes is in the closing loopholes bill that has been partially passed just at the end uh, of this year. Uh, that includes a, a number of reforms uh, around wage theft, uh, around labor hire uh, provisions, uh, around criminalizing uh, uh, various unfair practices uh, in, in workplaces. Uh, and uh, parts of it were passed uh, through the um, before Parliament uh, rose for the end of the year. Parts of it remain uh, to be passed uh, early next year. Uh, that would include some reforms around uh, gig work, uh, for example, and trying to offer uh, basic uh, protections uh, there. Other things the governments have done in the area of labor relations. Um, We've had a, a couple of uh, very good increases in the minimum wage uh, that uh, flow through into the awards system, uh, both uh, in 2022 and again in 2023. And that partly reflects uh, appointments that the government has made to the Fair Work Commission, which have been um, uh, of people more open to the idea of uh, trade unions and collective bargaining and uh, wage equality. Uh, so that's uh, that's another piece of it. There have been a number of changes around uh, gender equity in, uh, in the workplace that will uh, I think uh, support uh, demands for um, uh, better treatment, uh, job security, higher wages, uh, employment equity for women. Uh, so, you know, on the whole, I know that the, the government's obviously uh, disappointed in different areas, and, and we've covered uh, some of that in, on the environment and the fiscal uh, tasks, tax side of it. Uh, in the industrial relations area, I think the changes that have, brought, have come in have been significant and needed and will make a difference. But of course, there's going to be much, much more to be done, including in this area of uh, the free rider problem that I wrote about in this book. Um, Justin, coming back to you, uh, you were kind of talking about the fact that you were able to include a few later kind of submissions since October. Obviously, the Russia's war on Ukraine and now Israel's war on Gaza, we're seeing huge international conflict. Um, I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit more about some of those contributions that you've had um, about conflict and Australia's role there, I guess, um, in the in the last part of the year. 
Wow, yeah. And it's been quite busy since October, um, with especially with the Israel-Hamas uh, situation, um, the war there. Uh, so honestly, that because I just started this new role as international affairs editor right around that time, it's been um, all-consuming for me. And um, honestly, it's just been an, a, a kind of a, a process of finding our best experts in these areas, because uh, Middle East experts here in Australia uh, are, there's many of them, but um, you don't necessarily know who they are immediately because it's, th this is a conflict that's been going on for so long. We haven't, you know, they're not front and center in the headlines every single day. Um, but I found a, a couple really excellent voices. Uh, the one that I mentioned earlier, uh, Ayal Myraz from the University of Sydney and Ian Parmeter, um, also from, I think he's from ANU, who has become one of my go-to people because uh, he's so excellent on this topic. So um, he was the former ambassador, Australia's ambassador to Lebanon and has so much deep knowledge of this, of this region and the history. And I think you need to know the history to understand this conflict. Um, it's not something that just happened on October 7th. And uh, there's so much that goes, so much passion on each side and so many different threads that we've wanted to try to, to cover and to do in a fair and impartial and non-biased and kind of academic and expertise driven way. Um, and so it's been very difficult, um, but I think we've done some really interesting pieces. We had um, a, a very, very uh, esteemed uh, expert in anti-Semitism, Suzanne Rutland, write a piece for us on the history of anti-Semitism in Australia, which goes beyond you know the, the basics that we know about from what's happened in the, in the past two months. Um, to, she shares history from the beginning of, of settlement here, um, European settlement, which is a fascinating story. Uh, and I've had also a really great piece in the last couple of weeks on the West Bank, which hasn't been uh, covered as much um, because of everything that's been happening in Gaza. But uh, there's been more Palestinian deaths in the West Bank this year um, than there have been in the last 20 years since um, statistics have been counted by the UN. Uh, and we have an excellent piece by a couple of academics who study Palestinian, uh, the, the Palestinian cause, Palestinian history, and are really able to um, reveal what's been happening in the West Bank over the past couple of decades. So we're, we're going to continue to do these types of stories um, and, and try to get different perspectives. And, um, and we'll see where this conflict goes in the next year. Uh, just looking ahead to 2024, there's so much happening in this region as well that we're going to be covering. Um, I was thinking about the elections that are coming this year, coming year, uh, already in January, Taiwan, followed by Indonesia, South Korea, Pakistan, and India, all within the first six months of the next year. So it's going to be a massive year for uh, international affairs. Yeah, it certainly will be. And um, yeah, don't forget to head on over to the conversation if you want to check out some of those uh, really important articles. Uh, the rise in anti-Semitism uh, has been really concerning. And I know not just from this year, but previous years um, in Australia and around the world. And obviously um, we've also seen um, a rise in uh, Islamophobia as well, um, uh, which has been very concerning. Uh, so yeah, very good to hear. There's so many um, different contributions that people can check out. Um, uh, I've got a, what I think is probably actually a comment here rather than a question from Trevor, um, but it will bring me back to another question for you, um, Emma, on Trevor says that the woke leftist interventionist governments such as the Albanese government tend to socialist tendencies and that this approach intrudes on personal liberty and choices. Uh, but uh, there's a few other questions here about this idea of wokeness and the response to it. So I just wondered if you could talk to us about what that backlash kind of look looks like and, um, uh, you know, what people can expect from that. Sure. Um, I, you won't be surprised to hear, I, I get this a lot in, um, in conversations about, um, you know, so-called wokeness and how um, people feel, I think, um, imposed upon or unduly pressured um, to kind of use the right language. And I think, you know, I would I would point people back to that polling that you mentioned, Eb, where I think a, a lot of people actually understand rightly, I think, this idea of wokeness as as more about a, a, a compulsion, I suppose, to be empathetic, you know, to, to meet people where they are and to not be deliberately hurtful. 
and and really it is kind of a, a, as simple as that and and you know an acknowledgement that like we will get it wrong sometimes but that's okay and actually learning is a really important thing and embracing compassion is really important especially especially in politics but I also think that this I this idea of you know um, I mean like Richard will be able to speak about this more but like the idea that the Albanese government is socialist is um, kind of hysterical. <laughs> but 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 Biden the Biden administration you know has the same accusations leveled against it and and this is part of that kind of broader context I suppose of the culture wars where a a, a dominant class and in the United States that that generally means um, a white dominant class is feeling um, really challenged, I suppose, by changing demographics and changing conversations in the United States and is worried, even if, even if this isn't kind of like, a, um, I guess, front of mind and necessarily how they would say it, is worried about um, holding on to their power and, and holding on to their uh, control, I guess, of kind of social norms in the United States. And so beneath these kind of accusations, there are there's an effort to hold on to power. And that's what Trump has tapped into. You know, he he uses this kind of language around they're, they're coming for you. Well, you know, they're coming for you and I am standing in between you and them. And so it's this real effort to pit people against each other and to create or I guess to widen rifts in American society, which in turn undermines democratic norms and democratic principles so you know on the one hand like while it is kind of hilarious to to engage in conversation where you're rebutting the idea that you know Albanese or Biden are, are socialists um these, these kind of conversations have real consequences and it, as I said are kind of deeply embedded in the white supremacism that that Trump is tapping into and we have to we have to be aware of that and push back on it yeah, because oh, sorry. Oh, I, I just want to add, like you know, the 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 problem we have with these things is we're increasingly trained to look at particular policies or particular issues or particular crimes and kind of solve them in the particular, which is kind of interesting. But there's very little room in a country like Australia now to actually say, so what's really going on here? How does it fit together? And you know, ideology's seen as a dirty word, and you know, theory's seen as a dirty word, but. Once upon a time in Australia, the, the the right, the conservatives, had people like George Pell, who wanted to tell people exactly how to live their life, and libertarians like Andrew Bolt, who were like, no, no, freedom, government should get out of my way and I should be free. So you had this kind of strange thing in the Australian right. You had conservatives that wanted to tell women they could have a, couldn't have an abortion or all that sort of stuff, and who libertarians... Yeah, who you can marry. So you have these conservatives and libertarians working together. And that was always intention. But we've kind of fixed that now with nonsense like woke, because it's like, no, 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 uh, authoritarianism's fine and freedom of speech is fine as long as we're defining the parameters. We'll selectively apply both. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so don't, don't worry about consistency. That's so old fashioned. So there's freedom of speech about the things that I want to speak freely about. And everything else, we should be authoritarian and silence yeah. people on. And and really, like in Australia, we, we kind of have this bizarre vacuum of saying, hang on, how come it's okay to subsidise this group, but you say government spending's bad? Or how come you think freedom of speech is so important here, but you want to silence people there? And these are hard questions, but we just ignore them now. And and powerful groups with a loud voice just get to pick and choose. Yeah, and I was just going to throw into that um, the observations about, I guess, things like book bannings in the United States that are really clear kind of violations of free speech that seem to be the manifestation of this. And thankfully, I don't think we've seen that imported to Australia yet. But um, oh, it's here. Hopefully, that's not on the way. Oh not, no, there was yeah. that book about sex education earlier this that's year, right. where yes. conservatives were trying to get it banned in local libraries and yeah. and and smearing local librarians. So. Oh no, it's, yeah. it's a common. Uh, that reminds me. So that that book was written by um, Dolly Doctor. That's Any right. women watching will know the huge contribution that Dolly Doctor has made to women's health over many, many years. I was uh, outraged by that and had totally forgotten about it. Thanks for the reminder, Richard. Um, it's the worst thing you thought. <laughs> that's right. Um, Richard, uh, the next question is for 
you and it's about um, fossil fuels. And the question is from Ruth and she asks, how does the ALP not realise that Australia voted them in based on a desire for climate action? And a couple of other questions kind of talking about what, what would it actually look like if Australia was to to phase out fossil fuels? Yeah. Look, um, Labor know what they're doing uh, and they won the election and, you know, they're in government. I'm not. It's up to them to, quote, get the balance right. But here's the game. Uh, you know, I, I say that Labor sort of plays the game of percents. They love to kind of turn everything into percents so that hopefully the, you know, the, 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 the Liberals don't want to do many percents on emission reduction targets or renewables, and the Greens want to do lots and lots of percents. No one knows what a gigawatt hour is or any of that. It doesn't matter. And Labor just like to be in the middle, getting criticised by the Greens for not having enough percents and being criticised by the Liberals for having too many percents. And this works for emission reduction targets, renewable energy targets, fuel efficiency standards, anything. They, they just want to be in the middle getting criticised by everyone to prove that they got the balance right. It doesn't work with fossil fuels because they kind of say, well, we want to tackle climate change, but it's okay to have enormous expansion of fossil fuels. And it's a, it's a binary, it's a zero one. If you're trying to get off fossil fuels, why would you still be expanding them? And Labor's answer is, but look at the percents. Look at look at the solar panels that I, I want to build more solar panels than the Liberals. Yeah, but the question is why you still want to be massively expanding fossil fuels. And, and it kind of just blows their mind a bit. So really what Labor's trying to do is define climate ambition purely through the domestic prism. More panels, more windmills, tick, 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 that's good. And it's just kind of considered rude to, to bring up fossil fuel expansion because that way Labor can say to voters, look, we're doing good things without declaring war on a very powerful industry. So that's that's all it is. Is, is Labor want to define the parameters of the debate on the easy bit, roll out more solar panels, roll out more batteries, and completely avoid conflict with, with the fossil fuel industry. In terms of what's a fossil fuel phase-out look like, oh, it looks like cleaner air, it looks like cheaper electricity, it looks like far more people with far better jobs. You, you know, less than, less than half a percent of Australians work in extracting fossil fuels. 99.5% of Australians don't work in fossil fuels. And yep, we need to you know, help the people who lose their jobs in the fossil fuel industry, just like we should have helped the people that worked in photo development labs, just like we should have helped all the women that used to work in textiles, just like we should have helped all the people that lost their jobs when the call centres closed down, just like we should have helped the 14,000 people that Tony Abbott sacked from the public service when he won. So people losing jobs happens all the time, People losing jobs from fossil fuel industry is nothing to be excited about, but the idea that we don't make change in Australia because someone might lose their job, that's a brand new idea. You know, 200,000 people lost their jobs when the car industry, when, when the Liberals said, bye-bye car industry, we don't want you. 200,000 people, far more people than ever worked in fossil fuels. Mm. Uh I'm afraid uh, we're only got time for one more question. Um, so I might throw it back to Justin actually to wrap us up. Um, Justin, uh, I guess you were kind of casting ahead to a bunch of um, elections coming up next year. Um, but what does next year look like for the conversation? What are the key issues that you think people are going to be interested in the coming year? Well, probably a continuation about of a lot of the things we've been talking about today. Um, cost of living pressures will continue to be a major focus. The environment uh, and Australia's response will continue to be a huge focus. Uh, the U.S. election is another one I didn't mention, but that's coming up, and that's going to be a, a major focus for us, and as well as well as our colleagues in the U.S. As many of you may know or may not, we have a sister site, TCUS, uh, which you can read uh, more American-focused coverage on as well. Um, so, uh, you know, we won't be looking at a big issue, at least as far as I know, domestically, like the voice to parliament, uh, but um, you never know what's going to emerge uh, in the coming 12 months. Um, but what, what I would just say in closing with this book is it's it, obvious that anybody here watching this webinar cares about issues deeply or else you wouldn't you wouldn't be here to listen to these um, to these to this conversation. And so what I think is so great about this is you can catch up on the year that just happened before the next year begins. <laughs> um, you can read these essays in a very short amount of time because many of them are, are very short, pick them up, put them down. 
And then you can sound really great at your holiday parties when you're um, trying to make conversation and have debates with people. Because there's a lot of essays in here that I, you know, as an international um, affairs specialist didn't know much about, and that's ethics and artificial intelligence. That's another section in the book that uh, we have some great writing on and um, big ideas in higher education for the coming year, which was another whole chapter of the book. So I'd, I'd highly encourage you, uh, you all to check it out. Thank you so much. So the book is here, 2023, A Year of Consequence, edited by Justin and with contributions from Jim, Emma and Richard, who have joined us today. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for your wonderful questions. I'm sorry, as usual, we can't get to all of them. Uh, but just a reminder, um, we will have the recording of this up on our website. Um, there's also a special offer for people looking to buy the book. You can purchase that online with a bit of a discount. And uh, we will also ask you to make sure that you're subscribed to our podcast, Follow the Money, and our new one from our chief economist, Greg Jericho, called Dollars and Cents. You can find that on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you normally listen to podcasts. And please don't forget to sign up for Australia's biggest book club so that you can uh, get access to more great books like 2023, A Year of Consequence. Thank you to our panel, Justin, Emma, Jim and Richard, and thanks everyone for coming along today. We hope you have a wonderful festive season and we see you happy and rested in the new year. Take care, everyone. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to keep up to date with all our latest research and work, sign up to our newsletter. Delivered every fortnight, it includes behind-the-scenes updates from Richard Dennis, an exclusive cartoon from Judy Horacek, details for our upcoming events and webinars, as well as explainers, graphs, and not to mention the latest cutting edge research and analysis from the team here on the key issues that are facing Australia. Click the button on your screen to check it out.